Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to listen to my uh, informal remarks. It's a great pleasure to be here, a great honor to be here, and it's wonderful to reconnect with Mark uh, Duckenfeld, who was a colleague of mine in Harvard's government department. Uh, and so what I'm going to speak to you today is about a project that is in progress called Abandonment is in the Eyes of the Beholder. And as I'll explain in a few minutes, it's an outgrowth of a book project that I've been working on for the past several years. But let me begin by talking about some of the current controversies in U.S. foreign policy, in particular, the current administration's uh, policies towards various allies. If one were to simply look at the news coverage, one would think that U.S. alliances around the world are in a state of crisis, existential crisis, some would argue. Uh, certainly after the NATO summit last summer and the public disputes between the president and the German chancellor, the president and the uh, Canadian prime minister, uh, there were headlines on both sides of the Atlantic about NATO being in crisis. And yet with other alliances, one sees that the current administration is very closely aligned with the interests of other allies, in particular Israel and in particular Saudi Arabia. But yet, if we shift to the other side of the globe, to uh, East Asia, specifically to the Korean Peninsula, we have seen a remarkable transition over the past year and a half from a real sense of divergence between the strategic interests of South Korea and the United States over how best to deal with North Korea's uh, supposed thermonuclear weapons detonation and uh, long-range missile tests to the South Korean President Moon Jae-in brokering a summit between the President of the United States and a supreme leader of North Korea, the first time that had ever happened, and a switch in U.S. rhetoric from one of, uh, one would argue, or I would argue, belligerence, to one of assuming that the North Korean nuclear crisis is on the brink of being solved and that the complete verifiable, irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is likely any time in our lifetimes. I'm somewhat skeptical uh, that that's going to happen. But uh, the genesis of this project, as I mentioned, is a book project uh, that I have entitled Defending Frenemies, Alliance Politics, and Nonproliferation in U.S. Foreign Policy. And the question which animates this project is this. As a coercive strategy, how often have U.S. policymakers actually threatened to abandon weaker allies? How often have U.S. policymakers delivered implicit or explicit threats to terminate alliance ties or dramatically scale back those alliance ties as a strategy to induce a weaker ally's compliance? with American demands in areas deemed to be vitally important to the administration at the time. And my working hypothesis, my working conclusion, is that not very often. Contrary to popular belief, the United States, I would suggest, has rarely explicitly or even implicitly threatened to abandon allies, especially weak, strategically vulnerable allies in volatile regions of the world. And I will argue that the rationale for not issuing those threats is that those allies are valuable to the United States, and valuable to the United States are perceived as valuable to the United States because they are deemed to insist the United States in achieving two overriding objectives in their particular region of the world. One, to contain rival great powers or rising regional powers. And second, to preserve the United States' access to those particular regions of the world. These two objectives have been overriding features in U.S. foreign policy and grand strategy for the past 70-odd years. Across different presidential administrations, across different political parties, despite differences in presidential temperament, presidential management style, those have been the overriding objectives. And they remain so in 2018 and into 2019. Now, the book which I have mentioned, Defending Frenemies, 
Alliance Politics and Nonproliferation in U.S. Foreign Policy, 1960 to 1990, is an examination of a series of proliferation disputes between the United States and four somewhat problematic allies during the last three decades of the Cold War. And those allies were Israel, Pakistan, South Korea, and Taiwan, formerly the Republic of China on Taiwan. And what I do in the book is examine the variation in the types of non-proliferation strategies that successive administrations pursued toward these four states over time. My overriding argument in the book is that considerations of relative power dynamics, power dynamics in the allies region, and assessments of when threats to US interests might arise drove the types of policies those administrations pursued. And those policies varied along a continuum. At one extreme, you had policies which were purely coercive. And by coercive, I mean threats to undertake strategies that might possibly degrade the economic or the military capabilities of those allies, principally vis-a-vis -vis their local adversaries if compliance with American demands were not forthcoming. For example, threats to suspend foreign military assistance programs or to not sell particular weapon systems. Threats to impose economic sanctions. Threats to curtail or even end civil nuclear cooperation. And at the other extreme were purely accommodative strategies strategies which were intended to augment the economic and the military capabilities of those local allies should they comply with American demands. These would include the sale of new and more expensive weapon systems, the expansion of existing foreign military assistance projects, the provision of generous uh, economic development aid programs, uh, sometimes the increase in the number of U.S. conventional forces deployed in the Allies' territory or in the vicinity of the Ally. And then in the middle of this spectrum, you had what I refer to as hybrid strategies. Strategies which combined elements of accommodation and elements of coercion. Now, these proliferation disputes took place within both an international political context, but also within a domestic political context. Hence, I also argue that what shaped the types of strategies that administrations, beginning with John F. Kennedy's and ending with Ronald Reagan's, actually with George H.W. Bush's administration, were the types of domestic hurdles that these administrations faced in pursuing their preferred policies towards that ally. And those hurdles arose with the Congress. Several of these allies developed over time powerful domestic lobbies to support their interests. Others lacked such lobbies. Over time, certain members of the Congress, especially in the Senate, became extremely interested in nonproliferation issues and demanded greater transparency from at the administration of the day and began to enact legislation to tie an administration's hands. And sometimes administrations had to go to great lengths to persuade or dissuade certain members of Congress from invoking particular pieces of legislation in order to punish an ally when the administration officials deemed that doing so would be harmful to U.S. security interests in that region. So what we saw over the course of these four historical proliferation debates was a tremendous amount of variation over time. In the case of Israel, a nuclear armed state presently, although it neither confirms nor denies the existence of its nuclear arsenal, although it is a well-known fact that it is a nuclear armed state, we saw an evolution of US foreign policy from the Kennedy administration's uh, a pursuit of an overtly coercive strategy in the early 1960s 
to the Johnson administration's pursuit of a hybrid strategy to eventually the Nixon administration's pursuit of an accommodative strategy by the late 1960s and early 1970s, and a tacit acknowledgment that Israel was a nuclear armed state, and an agreement which was reached between President Richard Nixon and Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, the so-called Meir-Nixon Agreement of September 1969. The United States would become Israel's principal supplier of conventional weapons in exchange for the following guarantees from the Israelis. Number one, no nuclear weapons detonation. Number two, no public declarations of their actual nuclear status. And number three, no use of US supplied aircraft as a nuclear delivery vehicle. In the case of Pakistan, one saw a tremendous oscillation in U.S. nonproliferation strategies in the years between 1975, when the U.S. intelligence community first became aware of Pakistan's efforts to develop a nuclear weapon capacity, and 1990, when the George H.W. George H.W. Bush administration reimposed economic sanctions. Basically, U.S. policy oscillated from the imposition of economic sanctions for nonproliferation regions in 1978 under the Carter administration, 1979 under the Carter administration, to the provision of generous foreign military assistance to Pakistan's dictator Mohammad Zia Haq in the 1980s as a means to stabilize Pakistan and to provide covert military assistance to the Afghan insurgents fighting the Soviet Union in the 1980s, to the reimposition of sanctions after the Soviets had quit Afghanistan in 1989. And finally, with respect to the two Northeast Asian allies, South Korea and Taiwan, the dynamic was one of generally pursuit of hybrid strategies. Efforts to coerce both states to abandon their nascent nuclear weapons efforts in exchange for certain guarantees of American foreign military sales and continued nuclear cooperation. Now, I mentioned earlier that the overriding objective of US policymakers across these different administrations and across these different regions was twofold. Number one, to avert containment failure. Defined as any increase in the Soviet Union's economic, political, or military influence in that region. And that influence might have been manifest in itself as either territorial conquest, but more likely the formation or strengthening of rival alliances, the provision of generous foreign economic assistance and military assistance packages to local states that were adversaries of U.S. allies, greater economic penetration of the region. That was an overriding concern for U.S. policymakers in the Middle East, in East Asia, and in the 1980s in South Asia as well. The second concern, as I said, was access denial making sure that there was no, or averting access denial, was to making sure that there was no local actor, let alone a rival great power, who was capable of impeding the access that US military forces in those regions might have, or withholding critical resources from uh, US, uh, US forces, should the need arise. The dynamics, however, across the regions were somewhat different. Whereas in South Asia and in the Middle East, the overriding desire of US policymakers from the 60s to the late 80s, early 90s, was to deny the Soviet Union access to those regions to contain the growth of Soviet influence. In East Asia, during the period I examined, the overriding objective was to cultivate China as a potential ally, an ally of convenience against the Soviet Union. And that is where 
the nuclear weapons programs, the nascent nuclear weapons programs of South Korea and Taiwan prove problematic. The calculation made by officials in the Ford administration and the Carter administration was that if either Taiwan or South Korea marched further down the road to nuclear weapons development, that would severely complicate efforts to cultivate China as a potential ally against the Soviets. And so, therefore, the United States and I needed to provide guarantees to the Chinese that neither of those two states were going down the road of nuclear proliferation. Domestic politics in the United States intervened, and in both instances, U.S. policymakers wound up pursuing a hybrid strategy. That is what the book project examines. Four historic Cold War proliferation disputes between the United States and weaker allies. How does that relate to alliance abandonment, which is the topic of my discussion here today? Well, in two of those cases, South Korea and Taiwan, leaders were prompted to pursue nuclear weapons or to begin efforts to develop the capacity to acquire nuclear weapons because they feared that the United States would not come to their defense in the event of hostilities with local adversaries, North Korea and the People's Republic of China, respectively. Indeed, in the South Korean case, it was the Nixon administration, as well as in the, uh, the Taiwanese case, it was the Nixon administration's efforts to pursue three objectives in East Asia, which prompted both Jiang Kai-shek and later his son, Jiang Jingguo, and then later South Korean President Park uh, Chung-hee to uh, investigate the nuclear option. Number one, their efforts to extricate, or rather the Nixon administration's efforts to extricate the United States from the Vietnam War. Number two, efforts by the Nixon administration to reduce the U.S. military foot presence, not just in Southeast Asia, but in Northeast Asia as well. And number three, their efforts to cultivate China as an ally of convenience. Fear of potential U.S. abandonment is what prompted proliferation behavior. Now, that was not the intention of the Nixon administration at all. That was certainly not the intention of the Nixon administration, but rather that fear was an unintended and an understandable reaction on the part of Taiwanese and South Korean leaders, I would contend. The dilemma for U.S. policymakers, under Nixon, then Ford, and under Carter, was trying to balance, trying to balance those competing imperatives, cultivating China with reassuring allies, trying to find some way to dissuade Taiwan and South Korea from pursuing nuclear weapons, while at the same time reassuring China that those U.S. allies were not, in fact, pursuing a nuclear weapons option. Now, in the case of Israel in the 1960s, we saw a different dynamic. What brought about the evolution of U.S. strategy towards Israel's nuclear weapons program, principally the reactor complex in Dimona in the Negev Desert, was an overriding fear that the Soviet Union was going to increase its influence in the region. The Soviets increased their arms sales to Syria and Egypt well before the 1967 war. And I argue that the origins of the alliance between the United States and Israel really dates to March of 1965, with a decision undertaken by the Johnson administration to grant an Israeli request for military aircraft, the subsonic A-4 Skyhawks and M-48 tanks, in exchange for certain vague Israeli guarantees that they would not be the first state to introduce nuclear weapons into the Middle East. And that that relationship then became path dependent. And finally, in the case of Pakistan, well, Pakistan and the United States never had a bilateral defense treaty. 
to begin with. Pakistan was a member of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization as well as a member of the, of the Central Treaty Organization. The United States, for a while in the 1960s, began to see India as the more stabilizing force in the region. That is, until the 1965 Kashmir War, when the Johnson administration imposed an arms embargo on both India and Pakistan. But the turning point for Pakistan was really the 1971 war for Bangladesh. Pakistan suffered a humiliating defeat. It lost a third of its territory when East Pakistan broke away with Indian assistance and became the independent state of Bangladesh. And the then Pakistani president, later Prime Minister Zulkufar Ali Bhutto, made the decision that Pakistan would acquire a nuclear weapon capability, even, to quote him, even if we have to eat grass for a thousand years. That was undertaken, that initiative was undertaken because the United States had no commitment to defend Pakistan against its much larger, more powerful adversary, India. Pakistan began to be seen as more important to the United States beginning in the mid-1970s as a hedge against Soviet influence because India at the time was close to the Soviet Union and was a major purchaser of Soviet military hardware. And the oscillations in U.S. nonproliferation strategy towards Pakistan, I argue in the book, were driven by U.S. leaders' perceptions of the distribution of power in South Asia and the imminence of the Soviet threat to that region. And under the Reagan administration, as I mentioned earlier, the priority was to provide Pakistan with substantial foreign military assistance, both as a way of securing Pakistani assistance in getting covert aid to the Afghan Mujahideen, but also as a way of stabilizing Pakistan as a frontline state non-proliferation legislation notwithstanding. So where does this discussion or this discursion into Cold War history lead us with respect to whether or not the United States 27 years after the Cold War is likely to threaten US allies with abandonment as a coercive strategy? I would argue that the same dynamics that were at play during the Cold War which led the United States to forge an alliance with Israel and sell conventional weapons to Israel, which led to the oscillations of U.S. nonproliferation policy and military assistance to Pakistan, which led to the United States pursuing hybrid nonproliferation strategies towards Taiwan and South Korea, and uh, as an effort to try to reassure China, those same dynamics are at place today, despite somewhat different geostrategic circumstances. Both the 2018 National Security Strategy of the United States as well as the 2018 National Defense Strategy identify Russia and now a vastly more powerful China as the principal threats to the United States' security. It is also no secret that the United States sees Iran as a principal source of instability in the Middle East. So containing the influence of two great powers, one rising, one arguably declining, as well as containing the influence of a regional power, Iran, are the overriding objectives of U.S. strategy. So despite the media, I would say, hysteria about the Trump administration's America First strategy, despite coverage of presidential statements somewhat acrimonious uh, uh, encounters with foreign leaders, whether on the phone or in person, uh, at bilateral summits or in multilateral summit, uh, summit formats. The underlying objectives of US strategy, US strategy towards various parts of the world remain the same. Avert containment failure, preserve access. Yes, China is no longer, and has not been since 1989, an ally of convenience vis-a-vis -vis the Kremlin. It has become a pure competitor of the United States. Does that mean that U.S. policymakers are going to abandon U.S. allies? No, they would not make that threat. 
they did not make that threat to explicitly abandon U.S. allies during these four contentious proliferation disputes now 50 years ago, or in some cases only 30 years ago, and they're not likely to make those threats in the foreseeable future. So if there are three takeaways from my remarks today, they would be these. Number one, the U.S. desire, or the desire of U.S. policymakers, to avert containment failure and to preserve the access to U.S. military forces in particular regions of the world, largely shape U.S. strategies towards weaker allies, particularly bilateral allies, above all else. Number two, across the four historic proliferation disputes, which I examine in the book, U.S. leaders did employ coercive strategies at times, but those strategies never entailed implicit or explicit threats to completely terminate U.S. security ties towards those allies because those allies, although obstreperous, although bothersome, and although clearly inclined to pursue policies that U.S. policymakers thought were detrimental to U.S. In interests, were nonetheless instrumental in averting containment failure and preserving U.S. access. And number three, despite changes in presidential personality, despite changes in the ideologies that animate our two major political parties in the United States, despite changes in temperament and rhetorical style, there actually has been a tremendous amount of continuity in U.S. policy toward allies and in U.S. policy in general. So with those brief remarks, I would be happy to entertain your questions, your comments, your criticisms. I'm sorry that I didn't have a paper to present to you on this particular aspect of the project. The book, Defending Frenemies, is supposed to be released by Oxford University Press uh, in April, late April, or early May of 2019. So thank you. Wood Anderson, Seminar 11. Um, nice to meet you. Oh, right here. Oh, there, there we go. Sorry. That's okay. The, the, feedback, okay. I, the feedback makes yeah. it very difficult for me to figure out where the voice is coming from. So it's, I heard it in my head. Yes, it was coming from above. <laughs> so th this is uh, uh, kind of hovering around your comment that things aren't changing that much. But I'd like to go back to a comment you made right at the beginning about North Korea. And I'm curious, wh what is driving your skepticism of a nuclear-free Korean peninsula? Why on earth would Kim Jong-il ever give up his one bargaining chip? Why on earth would Kim Jong-il, um, rather, give up his one bargaining chip? He is pursuing the same strategy that his father pursued, which is to saber rattle, to threaten, to come to some type of negotiated agreement with the United States and South Korea that preserves his regime in power. Uh, gives some indication that North Korea might be willing to compromise on the nuclear issue, but doesn't really quite compromise, and enables his regime to survive for a few more years. If North Korea were to allow IAEA inspectors and U.S. inspectors complete unfettered access to all of their nuclear facilities. If North Korea were to provide a complete inventory of all of its assembled nuclear weapons, all of its components, all of its delivery systems, what bargaining chip would Kim Jong-un have left? None. None. That's not intended to be a criticism of any particular, well, actually, it is intended to be a criticism of any, <laughs> of, of any. well, it, it is intended to be a criticism. Who can I, I can't fool you here. But I think the idea of having a complete, irreversible, verifiable uh, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is an unobtainable objective. That might have been a viable objective in 2004. But we're in 2018. North Korea already is a nuclear arms state. We have to live with it. Yes, sir. Uh, 
this is a big dilemma. And it's a dilemma that no one has, to the best of my knowledge, and perhaps people here at the War, Army War College have studied this with greater uh, uh, depth than I have, but to the best of my knowledge, no one has yet figured out how to deal with the threat of hybrid warfare. Because hybrid warfare is designed to use the threat of force and threat of escalation and non-traditional means, primarily information warfare, social media, discrete attacks, use of, of uh, ununiformed military personnel, but keep it at such a level so that it does not rise to the level of a clear uh, Article 5 incident and require a full-scale kinetic response. The dilemma that the United States faced, and again, this is going to sound like another criticism, and it is a, a criticism, is that in the 1990s, the United States, with the, uh, uh, I was say, the assistance of certain European partners decided to expand NATO eastward, ever further eastward. And that created two fundamental, at least three fundamental problems. Number one, alliances. The more states that there are in an alliance, the more difficult it becomes to manage. If you go from having an alliance of 16 states to having an alliance of 27 states, well, guess what? You've increased the coordination problems. Second problem. Regardless of what the stated intentions of NATO expansion were, the reality is that the Russians, principally Russian President Vladimir Putin, although by no means exclusively Russian President Vladimir Putin, saw it as, if not an actual military threat, then as a grave insult to Russia's status as a great power, and resented it. And had an incentive because of the tremendous imbalance in military and economic capabilities to look for ways to target areas of US weakness and to look for ways to destabilize states around the periphery, but in such a way so that it would not escalate to an Article 5 level uh, incident. And number three, there's the dilemma of the credibility of US security commitments. During the Cold War, which I'm old enough to remember, there was a saying in the United States, what president of the United States would be willing to sacrifice Frankfurt for Toledo, Ohio? What president of the United States would be willing to put at risk uh, the survival of oh, Boston, my hometown, uh, for uh, the survival of Lyon? Well, the dilemma that we face now is, well, if conflict were to escalate to an Article 5 level, what president of the United States would be willing to sacrifice Boston for Tali, which, by the way, is a lovely city. I highly recommend going there, particularly in the summer. Uh, but that's a fundamental dilemma that the United States has had with all of its allies since 1945. One of the reasons why France developed an autonomous nuclear capability was because Charles de Gaulle made the calculation that, well, not only do we need it because we're a great power, but I don't think the Americans would defend us if push come to shove, so we better have an autonomous nuclear arsenal. And he began the road to develop a nuclear arsenal in the 1950s when the Eisenhower administration said, well, maybe actually having Western European states armed with nuclear weapons, autonomous nuclear weapons, would not be such a bad thing. Now, the Kennedy administration had a very different view on that, but it was too late. So the dilemma that the United States and its NATO allies face with respect to Russia is that Russia is unlikely to send columns of tanks marching, or the columns of tanks rolling westward in the same way that the Soviet Union threatened to do 30 years ago or 40 years ago. It will however, try to assert itself in both its so-called near abroad by destabilizing all of those states along its periphery and will continue to try to destabilize and sow political and social divisions in the states, uh, the core states of NATO in Western Europe, including in France. And no one, not on this side of the Atlantic or on the other side of the Atlantic, has yet figured out a good strategy. To, to try to combat the hybrid warfare threat. So I'm sorry I can't give you a more optimistic answer to that question.
Uh, who, please, Tammy. Okay, Jeff, thank you uh, for wonderful remarks. Um, you and I are both uh, students of and admire, admirers of Bob Jervis, so yes. we know that cognitive psychology matters, perception matters a lot. Um, you know, I get the sense, certainly I had a little bit of insight into the McMaster NSC, and I can, from watching, have some insight into the Mattis DOD. And it's clear that there, those two individuals worked and are working very hard to maintain continuity and to reassure allies, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have insight into the Bolton NSC, so I don't really know what's happening there. Um, but in terms of you know, coming back to this idea that words matter, um, even if there's a lot of reassurance going, going on behind the scenes, if the chief executive is still arguing in language that sounds coercive to allies or that sounds, that they hear as the potential for abandonment, is there not a risk of that adding up and the idea starting to catch hold or to gain traction, uh, just in the sense that, you know, words matter and if people are anxious about something and you hear something over and over and over again, you might actually start to believe it, despite what, however hard we may be peddling under the surface of, of the. So at some level there, the, with the NSC, the former NSC, the current DOD, there's a little bit of the ignore the man behind the curtain <laughs> strategy going on or, or articulation of strategy. But you can't entirely no. ignore the man behind the curtain. He, he, he is the chief spokesman, the policymaker, the commander in chief. Um, so how do you, how do you walk that tightrope in terms of the way that you think about this and the way that you understand this problem. Because I, I worry that the words will add up and that we will inadvertently end up ailing. And I, I think, I wonder if in the case of the TPP, abandonment of the TPP, we didn't do a bit of that. So I'm anxious to hear your views on, on that particular yeah. point. I think that my personal view is that abandonment of the TPP was a, was a strategic mistake. Uh, because the TPP was designed, was intended, in part by the Obama administration, as a way of enmeshing China in an institutional framework. You know, there's the old saying, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. Uh, and by having China in the TPP, uh, by creating this type of institutional mechanism, that was one way to do it. And you know that I'm not a big believer in the role of international institutions, because scholars who study international institutions tend to pay very little attention to relative power. Uh, but I thought that that was a smart strategy. Uh, yes, words do matter. And there have been you know, previous presidents of the United States who have precipitated crises uh, with allies because of their words. Jimmy Carter did this with respect to Korea. Oh, let's pull out all uh, remaining 40,000 US uh, combat troops from South Korea. Why? What's the rationale, Mr. President? Um, with the current occupant, with the current president of the United States, Yes, I think that the, the words that he uses with, with respect to U.S. alliance commitments and his words with respect to particular U.S. allies have been extremely unfortunate. I'm of two minds. I have an intuitive sense, like you do, that eventually there will be a tipping point and certain, certain allies make him the conclusion that, well, maybe the, the United States isn't going to come to our aid, except that, number one, these relationships have lasted far longer than any president of the United States. And I think that people in the rest of the world, including US allies, recognize that the longest this president will serve or that any president will serve will be eight years. That doesn't mean that a current president or any president could do damage, can't do tremendous damage in eight years, but I think that there is that sense. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there's also the sense that perhaps we can work around him. Perhaps you know, we can draw a, a distinction between the bluff and bluster uh, of certain statements uh, and can either appeal to his vanity, which I think is what happened in the case of the Singapore summit in the summer of last year. I mean, I thought that you know, the, the winner of the Singapore summit, if anyone, I mean, the two winners of the Singapore summit were Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in. 
Kim Jong-un because he got the status and recognition that his father and his grandfather never got. A face-to-face -face meeting with a sitting president of the United States. That had never happened before. And that legitimated his regime. The other winner was Moon Jae-in because he managed to defuse an escalating crisis on the Korean Peninsula with North Korean missile tests, it seemed like every three or four months, and increasingly belligerent rhetoric out of Pyongyang and Washington, D.C., much of it over social media, sometimes uh, uh, on the floor of the United Nations General Assembly. So for Moon, his primary objective was de-escalate it. He lives with a nuclear-armed North Korea every day. They're only 35 kilometers away. So from his standpoint, Moon Jae-in's standpoint, North Korea having intercontinental ballistic missiles is really not that much of a threat when they can level Seoul with conventional artillery and have been able to do so for decades. So uh, yeah, I, I understand your question, and I understand, and I, and I, and I empathize with it, but I, I'm just, I am just unsure as to what exactly the tipping point would be in terms of presidential statements, presidential rhetoric, and an ally's conclusion that the United States is absolutely, irredeemably unreliable. I don't know what that point would be. But we seem to be testing it to some points, <laughs> some parts. Mark. I mean, maybe I could give you a circumstance which the U.S. would seem to be extraordinarily unreliable when, uh, you know, an Army War College graduate was president of the United States. Dwight Eisenhower managed in uh, the Suez Crisis, which you sort of alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. to throw uh, simultaneously France, Britain, and Israel under the bus, you know, a week before a general election in the United States. And I, in all three countries learned very serious uh, lessons from the U.S. attempt to pull back from, you know, in the case of France and Britain, two of its then closest mm -hmm. allies, and so much so that, you know, Charles de Gaulle feared, a, you know, a Suez on the Rhine. So it seems like the counter story is also true, right, that the, it's embedded in your, your cases that this fear of U.S. unreliability then instills the allies to invest in nuclear development or other alternatives, whereupon the U.S. starts getting very antsy about proliferation and then becomes much closer to them and, and sort of ha handcuffs itself to them. So I wonder, if, are there any further lessons we can get from that sort of behavior? Because it's a pretty dramatic example of, mm -hmm. you know, really pulling back from a core alliance. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, basically Dwight Eisenhower uh, gave uh, Britain, France, and Israel. And Israel it was not a U.S. ally at that time, but Britain and France were the back, ha back of his hand. You know, he warned them beforehand, he said, do not do this. But they did it anyway. And they did it right before a U.S. general election, which is not the best time to do anything you know, that, that might precipitate a crisis in your relationship with the United States. Um, you know, in trying to figure out this topic, there were two, there were two broad routes I could, I could have taken. And it would be very difficult to do them in both, in both, uh, in a single project, which was number one, trying to assess the credibility of U.S. alliance commitments uh, over time in the eyes of allies, because that does vary. And that's implicit in the story that I've told about the Israeli, uh, not so much the Israeli, but especially the Pakistani and the South Korean and the Taiwanese nuclear program. Those three states, but especially Taiwan and uh, South Korea, initiated nuclear weapons programs because they feared the United States just simply wasn't going to defend them against a local ally, against a local adversary. There's that story, and then there's the other story which I was trying to tell, which was, well, actually, the United States, or U.S. policymakers, never explicitly threatened, never explicitly used you know, the threat of, if you do not do such and such, we will not come to your aid, we are going to cancel this alliance treaty, or we are not going to meet these memoranda of, of understanding that govern our relationship. Because they nonetheless viewed these allies as important. Important not 
from the perspective of the Allies' interest, but from the perspective of the United States' overall interest in the region. So even while the United States was willing to, in some cases, give them the back of their hand and say, if you don't stop trying to acquire dual-use technology, if you don't stop trying to, to uh, acquire uh, uh, nuclear fuel reprocessing plants or avoiding IAEA's, IAEA safeguards, we will dramatically scale back our military sales to you. We will dramatically we'll cut off uh, foreign military financing. We will cease providing economic development aid. At the same time, there was never that, that threat of a clean break. So from the standpoint of academic political science, which is the world in which I inhabit right now, how I would go about trying to address those two questions, which are clearly related in the same project, is something that I, I am not quite sure how to do at that point. But I, I understand why you would ask the question. There was a gentleman in the back row. Yes, sir, you've been very patient. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll just hold it. <clears throat> Thank you. I've learned my lesson here. Uh, maybe just to tease out part of the thought that you were on as far as how the inquiry would be. Um, from your analysis of the Cold War era, is there perhaps the, the thesis possible that we would not have gone as far as we did our course of behavior, things we might have withheld or, or assurances we may not have fully provided? because, in fact, not so much of the control over the threshold decisions was exclusively in U.S. hands. There were alternative sources of materials, influence, assurances, and so forth. And if that was the case then, when it was really just one or two powers mm -hmm. providing most of those assurances, how much looser is that system, international system now, when we have so many more actual weapon states or incipient mm -hmm. weapon states. So mm -hmm. are we slipping in it? Is it even a more slippery slope or perhaps a higher mm -hmm. grade slope that we're on? There, there are two responses I have to that question. First of all, of the four states, the four allies that I looked at, Israel, Pakistan, South Korea, and, and Taiwan, what's remarkable about the four of them is they were all geographically vulnerable. None of them had geographic depth. All of them faced more powerful adversaries with aggressive intentions. All of them were isolated. The United States was South Korea's only ally. The United States was Taiwan's only ally. In the case of Pakistan, well, Pakistan tried to parlay both an alliance with the United States and an alliance with the People's Republic of China against, against, uh, against India. It was less successful in getting uh, actual military equipment from the Chinese during that period of time. Uh, later, it did collaborate quite closely with the Chinese in developing its nuclear weapon capability uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and in the case of Israel, Israel was isolated. Israel was isolated both within its region, uh, and it did have an alternative source of conventional military uh, uh, weapons in the early 1960s, right through to the end of the 1960s, that was France. They bought most of their military hardware from France. So in terms of potential allies, these states were always in a precarious position. They came to rely on the United States. Now in terms of their acquisitions of nuclear, cap in terms of nuclear technology, dual use nuclear technology, they did buy quite a bit from uh, the United States. You know, one of the great ironies of the Eisenhower administration's Adams for Peace program uh, in the late 1950s is that by selling research reactors to states as varied as South Korea, Taiwan, Israel, uh, and many others, the United States inadvertently gave them the means to both train their scientists but also to potentially go down the route to nuclear weapons development. That doesn't mean that all of the Atoms for Peace recipient states went down that route, but it was Yet, uh, one of the factors that enabled them to do that. In terms of the other things that they needed, you know, for example, heavy water. Well, Norway was a source of heavy water for the Israelis. Uh, in terms of reprocessing technology, well, France, specifically the, the firm Saint-Gobion Nucléaire, 
was a, a major exporter of, uh, ur of uranium fuel uh, reprocessing uh, technology in the late 60s and into the 1970s and the 1980s. And one of the things that the Nixon administration worked very hard to do, I shouldn't say the Nixon administration, I should say Henry Kissinger worked very hard to do when he was Secretary of State, was to set up the Nuclear Suppliers Group to try to cut off the flow of dual-use technologies to build upon the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is actually a fairly vague treaty uh, because it didn't have, I mean, other than prohibitions about non-nuclear weapon states receiving technology, it didn't have any enforcement mechanisms. And so here was the irony, Kissinger, who was actually adamantly opposed to the NPT, running around in 1973 and 1974 trying to create mechanisms to give the NPT some weight, some actual teeth. Yes. So did I answer your question somewhat? Well, I mean, somewhat, but I mean, the, perhaps the risk that we run, we ran then, or we're looking at that time frame, and we might, by extension, run even more now, is that um, for such critical national security decisions, it's not really in U.S. control to withhold the means to make those sort of programs viable. Mm -hmm. Different ways have been proven over time to take place so that, um, in fact, th this isn't so much a question of what, there may be our desires and our wants, but we don't necessarily have the power to withhold. And we, we never did. And we never did. We never did. But there seems to be sometimes an academic supposition that we had the no. means to control, when in fact, I would suggest it was less maybe. Yeah, I mean, there, I agree that there was, there is that academic supposition. There's also an academic supposition that there has emerged a very strong norm against uh, the development of nuclear weapons, the development of the potential uh, to, to acquire nuclear weapons that emerged in the 1960s, and that this normative structure is largely responsible for the fact that in an international system with now is it 198 member states uh, of the United Nations system, we have nine, just nine that have nuclear weapons. And I'm somewhat dubious of that argument for the following reasons. The vast majority of states in the international system never had the, the need, the demand for nuclear weapons let alone the wherewithal to actually go about acquiring them in the first place. So to say that the, and again, I'm going to make an exaggeration here to try to, to illustrate the point, to say that states like Burkina Faso, Fiji, uh, Mexico, and, and Singapore are strongly adhering to the nuclear nonproliferation, uh, the norms of nuclear nonproliferation, to my mind is a bit ridiculous because they neither had the means nor the demand to develop nuclear weapons in the first place. So you have limited demand, but also limited wherewithal. Developing nuclear weapons is complicated, it's expensive, it's extraordinarily risky, extraordinarily risky, uh, particularly if one uh, happens to be in the vicinity of a powerful state with whom one has a somewhat adversarial relationship. There's always the risk of a preventive military strike. Uh, so the states that actually decide to go down that road have to be, number one, pretty powerful, and number two, pretty well motivated to even pursue this. And again, to, to finish on this one point with respect to the, the Taiwan and the South Korean nuclear weapons, uh, weapons programs of the 1970s, these were, how can I put it diplomatically, not the most sophisticated nuclear weapons programs. One could, and not the, most, not the best organized nuclear weapons programs. These were basically hurried efforts on the part of, of uh, Park Chung-hee and then uh, uh, Jiang Kai-shek and Jiang Jingkuo to, to develop the potential, the potential to develop nuclear weapons. And they fell apart because of the difficulty of acquiring dual-use technology. 
aside from you know the U.S. pressure to stop them. So I hope that that's answered some of, some of your questions, some of your concerns. Yes, sir. With regard to Israel's program, you mentioned earlier that U.S. set three conditions. Yes. One of which was that Israel had to keep their program uh, undeclared or secretive. Assuming I understood that correctly, what would be the reason the U.S. would want Israel to keep its program undeclared? And what was the, the rationale then? And what about today to those conditions? Or why would it uh, um, still be in effect today? Kissinger was very clear on this point in the summer of 1969. He said, look, we know that the Israelis likely have a nuclear warhead at this point, And they clearly have the means to deliver a nuclear warhead at this point. And the Soviets likely know that the Israelis have nuclear warheads at this point and the means to deliver the nuclear warheads at this point. And the Egyptians likely know that the Israelis have a nuclear warhead at this point and the means to deliver them at this point. But as long as there is not a public acknowledgement of that reality, the Soviets will not have to respond to it. Nasser will not have to respond to it. The moment it becomes public, the moment it becomes a publicly acknowledged fact, it creates a very different political environment. If Israel were to say, if it were to confirm what everyone knows, that yes, we are a nuclear armed state, yes, we have been a nuclear armed state since June of 1967, Yes, the United States is complicit or has been complicit in our nuclear opacity for over 50 years. That puts everyone in a very embarrassing sort of situation. A very embarrassing. First of all, Israel derives a certain amount of its strategic deterrence from its opacity. Second of all, I mean, third of all, I mean, I lost my count. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, it forces other states like Iran and Saudi Arabia to react to that. Well, the Israelis not only have nuclear weapons, which we've known for 50 years, but now they're being quite open about it. Won't our own people demand a Saudi bomb or an Iranian bomb? And that ratchets up the domestic pressure on those other states. And there's also a question of international status. I mean, being a nuclear weapon state, being a declared nuclear weapon state, adds a certain amount of status and prestige to a state because there are so few. There are only nine. That's the rarest club in international politics. Nine states out of 198 have nuclear weapons. Public acknowledgement on the part of the Israelis would certainly ratchet up those status concerns on the part of other states in the region. And that's something that even now in 2018, the United States would not really want to see happen. It would make US foreign policy in the Middle East even more complicated as if that were possible. So. Uh, you gave us a really in-depth picture of the executive branch's role in this. Mm -hmm. And you alluded to in your remarks congressional hurdles. Yes. I wonder if you could speak to that, what you meant by that terminology. And did Congress play a role as a spoiler sometimes in this policy-making process? Well, let me answer the second question, second part of your question first. Yes, Congress was very much a spoiler, was very much a spoiler beginning in the mid-1970s. Congressional oversight of the executive branch is an important part of the U.S. constitutional, important part of the U.S. constitutional system. And during most of the period, not all of the period I'm, exam I'm examined, 60 to 1990, large portions of it in the 1970s, these were periods of divided government, in which the Democrats had the majorities in both houses of Congress and were facing Republican presidents. The congressional role as spoiler took the form, took several forms. One was the passage of nonproliferation legislation to restrict the autonomy of the executive branch uh, 
uh, in interpreting uh, the U.S. commitment to the nuclear nonproliferation regime and also to, quote, give the nuclear nonproliferation regime more teeth. This began with the passage of the Symington Amendment uh, to the 1961 Foreign Assistance Act in 1976, which required the cutoff of U.S. Uh, foreign military assistance to any state that was found not to be in compliance with IAEA safeguards. This was followed up with the Glenn Amendment, and then in the 1980s you had the Solars and the Pressler Amendment, which imposed additional restrictions on the provision of U.S. foreign military assistance. Uh, the uh, Symington Amendment actually had a provision which required the automatic cutoff of foreign military assistance if a state were found to be uh, in, not in compliance. The Pressler Amendment, which was one of the later amendments, required that the uh, administration had to certify on an annual basis that certain states, i.e. Pakistan, were not in possession of a nuclear explosive device on an annual basis. Now, from whence did this congressional interest in proliferation matters arise? There were a number of key uh, turning points. First, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War and in the aftermath of the Watergate scandal, the willingness of members of Congress, of both parties, but especially Democrats, to defer to any president diminished markedly. Second, India's nuclear detonation in May of 1974 and what Indira Gandhi, then India's prime minister, called a peaceful nuclear explosion uh, had a real catalyzing, catal uh, catalytic effect on U.S. nonproliferation concerns. India has a nuclear weapon. Oh my gosh, this set off all sorts of recriminations about what the Nixon administration was doing in terms of, of nonproliferation. It rekindled fears from the 1960s about so-called nuclear domino effects, the notion that if one state uh, detonated a nuclear uh, device or were on the road to detonating a nuclear device, then other states in the region would surely follow. And it led to increased congressional scrutiny of both the executive branch and also increased uh, uh, congressional willingness to enact proliferation legislation, in some cases over presidential vetoes. So Congress's role in proliferation was generally that of a spoiler during the period in which I studied. Now, interestingly, in the earlier period, in the first proliferation case I, I studied, which was the U.S. and Israel, and my case begins in 1960, and it ends in the aftermath of the 1973 Middle East War, the October 1973 war. In the early years, Congress wasn't that involved. They became more involved when the Johnson administration decided to sell, uh, proposed selling Jordan tanks in 1964 in order to, to uh, uh, preclude the Soviet Union from selling Jordan tanks. And they became very involved when it came to selling the A-4 Skyhawks and the M-48 tanks, and especially the debate about selling the F-12 Phantoms uh, to Israel in 1968 and 69. Uh, and that is actually when the Israeli government under uh, Levi Eshkol and then his successor Golda Meir became very adept at helping to mobilize domestic support in favor of arms sales to Israel. Uh, so uh, there were no such lobbies uh, in favor of large arms sales to Pakistan. Uh, there was a lobby in favor of some arms sales to South Korea, but in the period in which I examined the mid-1970s, much of the congressional action was deemed uh, was revolving around nonproliferation and also uh, uh, abhorrence of Park Chung-hee's human rights record. Uh, but the, overall, the congressional role was really that of a spoiler. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tai, for your presentation. Sadly, we've reached the end of our uh, time uh, here. But um, I, again, I'd like to uh, extend our thanks for coming from Boston to uh, speak, and uh, my appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.